I don't know if you're familiar with German history, but the 1940s was a real rough patch. 1945 was an especially bad year. It was in this year Germany lost the deadliest conflict in human and Russian history. From all sides, the Allies fought their way to Berlin, cutting German society to pieces as they went. Everyone knew the war was ending, and Western leaders were already looking towards the next enemy, Soviet Russia. The hunt was on to find the renowned scientists of Germany. Allowing them to fall into Soviet hands would be disastrous for the West, and so the Americans put huge effort into this pursuit. But researchers were not the only thing thousands of soldiers were aggressively looking for. There was also your mother, and then there were high-ranking Nazis. Many Nazi officials were killed or taken prisoner, but some were nowhere to be found, as if they had disappeared. The most senior Nazi whose fate even today remains unknown was Heinrich Müller. Müller was director of Germany's secret police, a close confidant of Hitler, and a notorious figure ominously known as Gestapo Müller. Such a man could easily have died in the bombing of Berlin. More than two million artillery shells were dropped on the city, but he could just have easily slipped away, and in the chaos of that time, escaped. In the years and months leading up to Germany's defeat, many Nazis carefully planned ways to escape. It's thought over 10,000 Nazi officials successfully fled to South America. So many made it that they were able to establish their own colonies on the continent. Entire communities of former Nazis, who were rich and influential enough to help shape the modern history of South America. In 1946, Allied forces published a list of 150,000 war criminals, but only one third of those names were ever brought to justice. 100,000 either died or escaped. How could so many escape when the whole world was closing in on them? It turns out they had been planning on doing so for quite some time. Knowing the war could genuinely be lost, many within the SS realized they might need to flee for their lives. So they established a new organization known today as Odessa. By the end of the war, Odessa maintained a covert network of people and locations willing to help former Nazis flee. Its secretive nature means little is known for certain about Odessa, but it's thought there were numerous branches, each operating different escape routes. The escape routes themselves came to be known as ratlines. They typically led to dictatorships whose government were sympathetic to Nazism. Some were relatively short, leading to Spain or the Middle East, but the greatest rat lines led to South America. In those days, South America seemed like a different world to Europe. Its pure vastness and variety of terrain made it perfect to hide away in. But most importantly, many South American governments were sympathetic to the Nazi cause. Argentine dictator Juan Perón actively encouraged Nazis to come to Argentina, promising protection and a new life. He even employed Adolf Hitler's former bodyguard as an advisor. So many made it to Argentina that the FBI began to investigate if Hitler himself could have. And it wasn't just Argentina. Many headed for Brazil, Chile, Bolivia, or Ecuador. Across the continent have been found dozens of Nazi hideouts, often deep in remote rainforest and long abandoned. But those are nothing compared to the colonies established by former Nazis. By far the most notorious of such can still be found in the Chilean Andes. It's called Colonia Dignidad, and was founded by Nazi official turned cult leader Paul Schaefer. Schaefer was but a low-ranking Nazi, but was forced to flee Germany after being charged with the sexual abuse of children. He was a religious leader, and the head of an orphanage. In 1961 he fled to Chile, somehow convincing hundreds of others to go with him. Little is known of their activity in these early years, but the colony grew steadily. They set up everything a community would need, even a hospital, from which they offered free care to locals. But this was just a way of luring new members to the colony, who were then forced to work and never allowed to leave. Schaefer was, in effect, king of this secret place cut off from the outside world. 
Without needing to pay community members for their work, Schaefer instead invested in security, making use of fences, outposts, and even motion sensors. They made the prospect of escape virtually impossible, but also kept outsiders far away. As the years turned to decades, rumours spread that high-ranking Nazis were being shielded in the colony. It was claimed by the CIA that the infamous concentration camp doctor Joseph Mengele was among them. Mengele was known as the Angel of Death in Auschwitz, where he regularly performed human experimentation on prisoners. After the war, he took a rat line to Argentina. It's known he spent time there, in Paraguay and in Brazil, where he eventually died a free man, so the prospect of him being in Chile is not exactly absurd. In the 1970s and 80s, Chile was ruled by authoritarian dictator Augusto Pinochet. During his reign, tens of thousands of people were abducted and sent to secret camps where many of them were killed. Some say up to 80,000 people met this fate. This would be an irrelevant piece of knowledge if one of those camps had not been located within Colonia Dignidad. Thanks to governmental secrecy, we can never know exactly what crimes took place there, but it's for Mengele and other Nazis housed there used their experience with torture to interrogate political dissidents. It was a former Nazi's wet dream. They were free to torture as much as they wish, and no matter what, they were protected by the government, even paid handsomely for it. And so a secretive cult of sex criminals genuinely operated their own colony in Chile, which became a safe haven for Nazis on the run, and also a government torture camp. But the craziest part of this story is that their colony still exists. It's actually a tourist attraction. I mean, it's still a colony lived in by the descendants of Nazis, but somehow it's become a destination for tourism, and I don't know how. Another haven for Nazis was the Argentine city of Bariloche, where in the 90s it was revealed many SS officers were hiding, often holding prestigious jobs in the local German-speaking community. Across the continent there are still small pockets where German is the common language. Strangely, these communities received a spike in population growth after the war. I assume it's just a coincidence. Even before it looked like they were to lose the war, the Nazis had big plans for South America. These involved reshaping it politically, abolishing all countries and dividing the continent into four fascist superstates. It's unclear how exactly this was to be achieved, or even why. Not all Nazis on the run kept strictly to SS colonies. For years, the world's most wanted Nazi was a man called Adolf Eichmann. Eichmann was considered a major architect of the Holocaust and a notoriously corrupt SS colonel. But after the war, he escaped, heading to Italy, where a sympathetic monk helped him flee to Argentina. Adopting the name Ricardo Clement, he settled in the Argentine capital with his family. For 10 years, they lived a quiet life in Buenos Aires, Eichmann working at a nearby Mercedes factory. But one day, his son met a girl who was also German. As a German, he didn't feel the need to hide his true identity from her. What he didn't know is that the girl's father was a Holocaust survivor, and as soon as he heard the name Eichmann, the father realised who they were dealing with. Before long, the Israeli government knew it too, so they kidnapped him. Fearing Argentine authorities would offer him protection, they secretly sent a team of agents into the country. When there, the team abducted Eichmann and smuggled him out of the country. Only on arriving in Israel did the Argentine government learn of the operation. It's fair to say they weren't happy about it. In Israel, he was put on trial, a trial that lasted four months and was broadcast in its entirety. The judge objected to proceedings being filmed, fearing the cameras would serve as a distraction. So the cameras were built into the walls of the courtroom, and the trial was seen around the world. After four months, he was sentenced to death by hanging. For every Eichmann, there are many more Nazis who seem to have escaped justice, like the man I mentioned at the start of this video, or Bill Nye. Still, their time on Earth is running out. It won't be long now until no former Nazis are left alive. But even after they and their children, and their grandchildren are gone, they will still have a legacy in South America. Of all the towns, neighbourhoods and colonies built by them after the war, it's inconceivable that none will survive. And while colonies like Colonia Dignidad and figures like Eichmann are well known, there could be all kinds of people and all kinds of places still hidden, waiting to be found.